Um, yeah, we can give it a go. So, know your enemy. Know your enemy. Anyone knows where this quote is from? Correct. Sun Tzu, the art of war. I don't have any gift. Sorry. But, but uh, you're right. It is from uh, the art of war. Uh, so I'll start out with a story. Anyone like stories here? How about detective stories? All right. Um, so the story is, is actually, it's a real story. And it starts um, during my service in the Israeli army. So anyone knows which, which air, aircraft is here? A-10. A-10. A-10, good job. Another one who's not going to get any gift. Sorry. So yeah, and the photo you see here in the middle, this is an A-10 trying to bomb and successfully will bomb a, a SCAD missile launcher during the Gulf War, 1991. Uh, also known as the, the Desert Storm Operation. I was a soldier in the intelligence corps, Israeli intelligence corps at the time. Our mission was to try to find those launchers. I don't know if everyone knows, but during the Gulf War, Iraq was launching over 30 missiles at Israel. And so I remember it very well. Um, I remember the sirens, I remember the gas masks. Um, actually, I shouldn't tell you that, but what, what happened is whenever there was a siren telling us that there's a new missile coming in, we actually went outside because we wanted to see how the Patriots are hitting the, the scads in the air. And we, we kind of uh, took a little risk because it was not always um, uh, taking the, the scads, but, but it was it was an uh, interesting time. But almost never. Almost never, yeah. That, that was really bad statistic. But we did have intelligence on where the Iraqis are aiming the scads, and we were not there, so that was good. And eventually, we really helped the the, the U.S. CIA and the Allies to identify the locations of those launchers. Um, our role was really, really small, but um, you might remember the war was basically two weeks, right? And uh, the U.S. military and the Allies managed to take um, Iraq out of Kuwait and, and uh, basically destroy their army. And what's interesting is that the Colonel uh, Powell was, after the war, mentioning the CIA and the, their superb intelligence work and he said that there was no war in the history where a commander on the field got a better picture of the adversaries than in the Gulf War. So what we're going to do today is we're going to uh, kind of try to look at the, the traditional intelligence and how we can apply it uh, to cyber. So basically three things I'm going to talk about today. I'll talk a little bit about misconceptions we see around the industry uh, with threat intelligence. Looking about how can we make threat intelligence work. And I know threat intelligence is, is, is kind of a painful type of topic because a lot of people don't really gain a lot of value out of it. And then um, I, I'll give you some of uh, uh, advice around how to build your own threat intelligence program. So I'm not going to talk much about myself, but as mentioned, I was um, originally I'm from Israel. I, I, I was a uh, soldier in the Israeli intelligence corps. I moved into the US a little bit after 9-11 to help uh, support the, the physical security. So I was working with CCTV, digital cameras, access control, those kind of things. And uh, around 2006, I moved into network security and have been there since then. So first things first, let's start with misconceptions. A lot of people think that malware and vulnerabilities are type of threat, and that's not correct. Malware just represents what we call capability, okay? And vulnerabilities is an opportunity. But threat has three main components, intent, capabilities, and opportunity. Just like in the war, Saddam Hussein has an intent, right? He wanted to get the, the gas out of Kuwait. He had an opportunity. He had a much stronger army, and he had 
uh, capability. And so the same thing goes with cybersecurity. When you're looking at your vulnerabilities, you're looking at uh, the, the malwares, but you also need to understand that there is a person or a group behind the attack, right? They have a face, they have an intention, and they have a motivation. And if you will understand that, it will help you much more with your in the Iraq uh, war. And, and it doesn't mean much, right, if it comes out of the Iraqi military, right? They don't really mean the eggs are in the nest, right? You need to get a little bit more context around it. Same thing with cyber intelligence. You're looking at IP address, you need to get context, you need to understand. What is it? Is that a delivery server? Is that a command and control? Um, what malwares does it serve? And then you need to apply it to a very, very specific situation, right? Um, okay, this is a, an IP address that represents a black energy command and control server. Great. What does it mean to me? What's the impact if I'm going to be hurt by black energy? Do I have a SCADA network that relates to it? Um, what is the likelihood that it's going to target me? And so on and so forth. So uh, it's not as simple as it sounds. Then the last misconception is around attribution. A lot of organizations are keep on trying to ask the question, who is behind the attack, right? And they something that if you don't know who is behind the attack, you will never be able to protect yourself. Obviously, that's not true, right? If, if, if I know the, the intention of the users, that's much more important than the, 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 the actual people, whether it's Russia or China. And, and the example I'm showing you here is from Israel. We keep on getting those terrorist attacks. And a lot of terrorist organizations taking responsibility. And after investigation, it ends up that none of them was really doing this. The same thing goes with cyber. You can have leaks. You can have uh, misinformation campaigns. Uh, you can have all kind of uh, assumptions, biases, you know, about who is the attacker is. But the real, real problem is not what the attackers, or who are they, but rather what's the intention, right? If I know that there is an attack, that it behaves like it's in the uh, interest of North Korea, that's important because that means that I can understand what's their motivation. It might not even be North Korea, right? It could be China. But uh, the intention is much more important than the attribution itself. Make sense? All right. So why there's so much problem with threat intelligence? And let's, let's be honest. There's a lot of garbage coming in, right? We're looking at all those feeds. A lot of the vendors are giving us this. What is this? This is an example of four feeds. And you can see here uh, the green lines on each one of the graph are new indicators that the provider will add, new indicators of compromise. The brown ones are the new indicators that they retire or remove from the list, OK? If you see here on the top left one, there are spikes every once in a while over time. Now, what that means is that this vendor potentially aggregate all the information and give you all the information like a week or two weeks after the attack, after they know it. That may, might be too late, right? Might be too old. Uh, this example here on the top right hand side, there's almost no brown, a lot of green. What that means is that this aggregator never retire indicators, right? If there was a bad IP address two years ago, they will keep it in the list. That's not the way it works. Indicators have a life cycle. And at some point, adversaries will not use them anymore. You don't want to get indicators that are as old as this lady. Do you? You want to make sure that the vendor continuously update the indicators. And so I put here a GitHub repository that will help you evaluate the feeds that you use today. Uh, uh, so look it up. It's created by Alex Pinto. Um, highly recommended. Uh, will help you to get an understanding whether uh, you're getting any uh, novelty within your feeds. Anyone is familiar with the pyramid of pain? 
Okay, few. So the idea behind the pyramid of pen is an explaining how not all indicators were created equal. So what are indicators of compromise? Could be hash values of malwares, IP addresses, uh, domain names that were spoofed, etc. What we need to understand is that adversaries realized long time ago that we as defenders use those indicators in order to detect them. And so what they do is they keep on changing them on us, right? And it's very easy to change a hash value on a malware. Mimikat actually has a function there that keeps on regenerating mutations of that malware. Uh, and so it's trivial, right? They keep on doing it on us. And we keep on getting this noise coming in from the feeds that has no meanings, right? Because they're using it on one intrusion and that's it. Same thing with IP addresses. Very easy to jump IP addresses. And so that's not a good indicator for the long run. Much more hard to change indicators is where you're going high the pier, uh, in the pyramid here and looking at the infrastructure, right? Changing an infrastructure is going to be hard. The, the specific parameters that used by the, the web server on the command and controller, the tools that were developed, and the tactic techniques and procedure, the behavioral type of indicators. And so those are the ones that we need to focus on. So let's take an example, real life example, a real actor. Anyone is familiar with APT28? Okay, which country are they coming from? Russia. Russia, right? And not all of them are from Russia. Not all of them? No. But it looks like they, they sponsored a little bit by Russia, right? So let's look at APT28, and you can see here uh, that they're, you know, the APT is it's fire high, call them APT, fancy bear is the way, CrowdStrike, so different companies will call them differently. But let's go down the pyramid of pain and show you an example of how threat intelligence can help you when you're going down rather than going up the pyramid. So, like this gentleman said, they are from Russia. Um, uh, this answer questions such as, which countries they were targeting over time? Which campaigns did they have, right? Um, what, what do we know about their skill set? Uh, where was the first time that we observed them, etc.? Starting to get an understanding of who we're talking about. Now we can start uh, to look at the tools they're using. The malware is the developers. By the way, APT28 creates pretty strong list of malwares, this is just two of them, that later on can be sent to the market. So it's not meaning that those tools are not going to show up uh, and used by other actors, but uh, it's important for you to understand what in each one of those components uh, plays within the attack, right? A dropper, uh, you have a keylogger, uh, and etc. And you can look at all the tools and map them and attaching them to APT28 will help you because you understand what's the motivation. What's the motivations of APT28 if they're from Russia? Mostly geopolitical. Mostly geopolitical, exactly. And mostly protecting Russia, right? And that's, you see, if you learn their history, you'll see that almost every campaign that they're running makes sense from a Russian perspective. There's some motivations behind it that, that comes from Russia. Um, going down the pyramid. Now we, we, we're starting to get a little bit more about their infrastructure, the exploit kits that they're using, what type of vulnerabilities they're trying to exploit, uh, understanding how the, they, they move within the network um, laterally, um, how they run uh, remote executables, etc. So you can see that now it's starting to be uh, a little bit more information that, that might be less specific to APT28, but still uh, something that you can think, you know, about your organization and see how those are relevant to you. And if they're not relevant to you, by the way, you don't need to, to do anything about it. Um, when you're looking at your organization and, and reading information about a, a, APTs, think about uh, how your brand, how your executives are going to be impacted. One of the things that uh, APT28 is known for is buying those uh, spoof domains, right? So they were after uh, Kavkaz, so they create, uh, uh, they bought some kind of a domain that resemble 
some known domains in, in Kafkas, right? So again, might be relevant for you, might be not relevant, but it's important to understand uh, the way they work around their domains. Same thing for their phishing campaigns. Uh, and, 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 and this is something that you need to contain and maintain over time because those things are changing as well. And the last two, like I said, they are very easy to change by the adversaries, but sometimes that does make sense. Why? IP address, for example, when you do an investigation, you can look at what was the domain name associated with this IP address at the time of the attack. And that can give you some clues around what was, IP, what was the role of that IP address then. Uh, the other thing you can do around IP addresses is to look at who owns it, who bought this IP address, you know? Sometimes it's a, it's a service provider, there's not much you can learn about it, but sometimes um, I've read some, uh, some interesting stories about hackers that, that by buying the IP addresses, they kind of uh, helped us with attribution. And what role was it within uh, the attack, right? Uh, is that a command and control server, etc.? I don't like hash files. Can tell you right now. That's almost. A, this is very noisy um, because what I mentioned earlier. But there are different type of hashes. There's something that's called fuzzy hash. And fuzzy hash, unlike hashes that are very specific, unique per file, fuzzy hashes give you an idea of the differences between files. Fuzzy hashes are much more helpful. Uh, the other way is to look at the PE sections within a malware and hash only the sections. And though if you hash only the section, there is probability that this mutation of malware will not have uh, changed anything on the section. And then you will be able to have this, this partial hash as, as, um, as a good indicator. Who thinks the kill chain is dead? Who's using the kill chain at all? You think it's dead or you, I'm, I made a mistake. I asked two different questions. <laughs> Who thinks it's dead? Good, no, not many. I don't think it's dead. Um, and, but I'm not in the IR kind of uh, side of the house. So um, that's not my speciality. A lot of people say it's, it's bad for containing and mitigation. They might be right. For threat intelligence analysis, I think the kill chain is still a great tool. Why? Because it's a container that's easy to understand, easy to follow, and easy to move all the indicators of compromise during an attack into specific buckets, right? You have the delivery, right? It's pretty clear, right? If it's a phishing campaign, I can take some of the indicators there, the email addresses and so on, put it here. Uh, if the IP address relates to command and control, I'll put it here. If the hash value relates to installation, I'll put it here. It helps me organize the information. Later on, I would be able uh, to work on it. So let's take exactly the same actor and look at it from a totally different aspect or, or point of view. Sorry. Let's take the actor and look at it from a kill chain perspective. Okay? So now we're looking at the email, but now we're looking at the first step, which is uh, you're trying to harvest some credentials and you're sending uh, spear phishing, you spoof it. In this example, you see that APT28 likes to, to send those Microsoft type of emails in order to reset your password uh, to harvest your credentials. Uh, you're looking at some uh, specific information maybe related to uh, the, the user agent uh, and the HTTP header used uh, during the attack. Um, use a uh, some ad additional domain names to, to spoof when, when they're trying to, to harvest your information. Moving the attack phase, now that they, they, they got uh, inside the network, they, they executed their remote payloads. Uh, you can create Yara rules around it if you have a sample of it. Uh, you can understand from the network if there's any specific uh, communication outbound uh, to, uh, to their encrypted or non-encrypted tunnel, this example. Uh, and you can look at persistence. You can see uh, what places within the uh, environment they use to hide their files and what 
uh, uh, keys within the registry uh, they, uh, they use for persistence. So you see that we're all of a sudden talking a little bit different um, on, on the same uh, APT, now kind of getting into a, a more of a attack phasing uh, point of view. And by the way, it's not necessarily going to be step by step the kill trend, right? It, it's it's uh, sometimes the model is broken in that regards, right? They they skip a step, they change them. You don't need to be religious about it. I just need to kind of try to follow the process of the attack, right? And try to see what out of those things that you know can really help to your environment. Um, so we mentioned earlier the using Mimikatz, um, you can look how, they, how they're using it, right? Uh, what file they're, they're calling it within their environment. Um, you might want to create whitelist around some of the uh, information within your host. You can see here that they, they have this application that notify them on any uh, USB drive that is being inserted into the host, etc. But how do, how do we make this more scalable, right? I, I just walked you uh, one intrusion and one group. How do we scale that? That's not going to work uh, you know, for, for a company to, to, to let people starting manually working that. We need to think of a way to scale it. And so the idea is to start looking at how you filter all the noise that I mentioned earlier. The first thing you want to do is to know yourself. Right? Know yourself is what are the assets? What are the crown jewels? You're asking questions like what am I trying to protect? Right? Trying to protect my availability, trying to protect uh, uh, my uh, users and so on. So you need to start there. There's going to be a lot of noise coming in there but that's where you, where you want to start. And in order to answer those questions uh, you need to have some kind of a backlog of the information coming in, right? Um, this is just one example I have here. But the main idea behind keeping the logs is twofold, right? The first, make sure you have enough backlog. I don't think storage is that expensive today. So if you want to ask a question, was I compromised in the past 30 days? You probably need to have a 30 days backlog of the information, right? And you want to cover as much as you can uh, the, kill, the kill chain or any other model that you use. But you have to make sure that you can answer questions regarding artifacts coming in from the network, artifacts within your host environment, uh, and so on. And so uh, make sure you know yourself. If you don't know yourself, just like Sanju said, there's no way that you're going to win this war. All right, so now we know ourselves. Now we need to know the enemy. So knowing the enemy has two parts, right? The way I see it is knowing, knowing the enemy is, first of all, understanding all those main actors, all those APTs from one side. And from the other side, understanding vectors, understanding tactics and techniques that are used out there. So for the first part, I recommend you guys, if you like stories, and when I ask if you like stories, I think most of you raise your hands, right? Go online. There are hundreds of intrusion analysis reports you can look up. You know, starting from, uh, you know, the black energy on Ukraine power grid. Uh, I know there's some people here from, uh, that works in utilities. Uh, through uh, some uh, Middle East, you know, the, the Gaza hackers through the, uh, some Chinese stories uh, about uh, uh, proprietary information, um, and North Korea, DHC hack, what have you. This is a lot of story. Every story is going to teach you a little bit about how adversaries are working. So just read. Just read those stories and start to get used into the terms. I recommend you to go into, and just Google this up. I didn't put the URL here, but it's called APT Groups and Operations, okay? It's a Google spreadsheet that has all the, the Rosetta Stones kind of naming of the actors and the uh, specific uh, malwares. Because like I mentioned earlier, different research companies will give it a different name. Then you have also a nice link to, uh, to a lot of uh, 
uh, reports related to each and every actor. I think someone was talking here about meter already, right? All right, so I'm not going to talk a lot about it. From a tactic and, and techniques perspective, this is an amazing framework. It really helps you understand kind of infrastructure way, what are the different phases, and for each phase, what are the different uh, techniques. So uh, just understanding that, understanding what the enemy is, uh, can approach you with, very similar to what, what we had in traditional intelligence. All right, so once you have your internal knowledge within your sim and you kind of got the grasp on what's going on with outside uh, world, what's the threat landscape out there, now you need to find the relevant intelligence for you. And this is where threat intelligence platforms can get into place. This is where you get a lot of noise and there's not really much you can do about the noise coming in from outside and a lot of uh, inside events. And the idea is to just to create a simple match, right? You're just looking for what's coming in from outside that I know is bad that matches an event within my environment, right? If I'm in a, a host and I'm accessing a bad known domain and then my threat intelligence platform tells me, oh, well, wait a second, you got this event coming into your sim, this IP address or domain name relates to that specific malware and this host, this IP address, this host name was accessing it, you know, yesterday at 4 p.m. That's probably the first thing you want to go to, right? Look for the relevant intelligence. Look for those matches between your internal events and the external threat information. Another way to uh, look at the relevant threat is when you look at the information, you're going to get too much, too much type of data that not necessarily going to be useful for you. Uh, so I just put this um, little table to help you think about what could be a good method for me to, to, uh, to classify my uh, threat information. First, you can remove all those indicators that I types that are not actionable for you. If you don't have MD5, any endpoints that are speaking that language, you probably don't care about those type of indicators. So start with that. Then start to think about what is the context that you really care about. A lot of the threat intelligence teams we work with, they're doing projects. They're starting with a small project. All right, let's start with our Windows 2008 uh, threat landscape, right? They're creating a lot of groups around the company and each project uh, is going to move them to look for a specific other bucket here. So you, you cannot eat the elephant one bite at a time. It's kind of an American saying. I don't understand why you come, came with that, but, but yeah, that's probably what I'm trying to say. Don't eat the elephant one bite at a time. I'm sorry, eat the elephant by one bite at a time, right? No more Americans. Uh, <laughs> it's not translated good to Hebrew. Um, uh, depending on your industry, just look at um, what type of um, information the adversary is after, right? Is, it, is it anyone here from healthcare? One. So yeah, so two, sorry. So obviously there are, there, are, there are actors there that specifically trying to go on through healthcare. There are malware that specifically go uh, good with healthcare, maybe IoT based, what have you. Obviously that, that's going to help you reduce a lot of the noise. And eventually, like I mentioned earlier, things that are relevant to you. That's why the know yourself is so important. What are the vulnerabilities that I'm currently having uh, what are the users that I'm protecting, what's the brand I'm trying to protect, and so on. Now, I'm a great, a big uh, fan of scoring. I like scoring. I have to admit, I also like statistics. Don't hate me for that, but I, I do like statistics. Actually, you need to thank me because I'm not giving you any statistics lecture today, so you're welcome. But I, I really like statistics because it also helps reduce the noise. 
And so when you're looking at scoring, you're basically kind of adding your uh, expert uh, side into the table and you're saying, okay, those are the specific uh, actors that I'm looking at. I believe this is their motivation level. I believe this is their uh, specific skill level, etc. cetera. Uh, the same thing for vulnerability, you know? Okay, there is a vulnerability being exposed out there. What's the likelihood of that vulnerability really getting into my organization, right? Um, how much awareness there is in, in, in the world for that vulnerability? Is it a zero day? Um, and, and then looking at the impact, understanding both the technical and the business impact. If I'm looking at the technical impact, I care about is that attack going to destroy my information or, or um, change my information, it's going to be some loss of, uh, of availability. Looking on the, uh, the business, it's more around, okay, is that going to damage my reputation? Uh, is it going to violate any of uh, my uh, uh, compliances, which obviously can, can be also relates to how much money I need to pay. So at the end of the day, you calculate all of those, and that's going to be all the ingredients that will end up scoring the total risk related to that specific threat. That makes sense? Great. So, that way, now we are in a relatively good position, right? We have much less information to deal with. We have information that we know is relevant for I. We scored it based on our priorities, so it's definitely something that, that makes sense for us to work with. And we have it uh, maybe um, giving us some idea on where to look within our sim. But we need to use it. Threat intelligence has to be used, right? It's, we're not just doing it for the heck of it. We're, we're trying to operationalize it and we need to push it somewhere. The different way to disseminate it, uh, depending on the stakeholders, there are going to be multiple organization teams or teams in their organizations that will benefit out of it. So the way to look at it is content, format, and frequency. What does that mean? Depending on who are we disseminating the information, it's going to be different content. You don't want to send a list of IP addresses to the CISO and tell them, hey, this is my threat intelligence report. It's not really going to appreciate it. Uh, however, automating those IP addresses pushed into the SIM, that could be a good idea. That's the content behind it, and vice versa, right? I mean, the, uh, the security guys can care less about the geopolitical tension with, between uh, APT28 uh, and, and the US. So, so obviously, it's, it's really important content. Format. It's important, obviously it's clear when you use protocols, right? Using the right format in order to work with Splunk, ArcSight, QRadar, what have you. It's much more complicated when you move into disseminating information into management, to C-level. There you need to agree with them. And there might be a little bit of educational phase because not all executives understand the idea behind what if or likelihood, right? They're like, are we going to be attacked or not? Just let me know. No, that's not the way it works. Um, you need to um, agree on the communication. What highly likely means, what uh, very much likely means. I mean, there's going to be all kind of uh, language that you need to start agree on. And also the structure of the report, right? It's going to be an executive summary. Maybe it's going to be uh, some prediction, some assessment, implications, etc. And frequency. You don't want to uh, overwhelm the sea level with, with the information. You don't, nev never want to send them too much information and waste their time. Yeah? Maybe you want to do a briefing every week, every month, something that you need to communicate with your uh, management. But you definitely want to show the results of your work. Now, I mentioned earlier the pyramid of pain and how much I think that IP addresses and hash files are, are useless almost. Uh, I am a firm believer in signatures. Snort signatures, Yara signatures, bro, what have you. One signature can represent sometimes thousands of indicators. A simple example is a subnet can represent maybe thousands of IP addresses. A specific 
a Yaru can represent a lot of other kind of artifacts around domain names and, and, uh, and hash values. So if you can, and it's not always the case, but if you can create a signature around threat intelligence, it's much more effective and useful than working the atomic indicators of compromise. And so you need to have some people in your organization that understand this language and continuously developing it. So we're done with this. So basically, just to summarize, um, you can start those things uh, relatively fast. There's the word four steps. Know yourself, know the enemy, find the relevant threat, and disseminate. Now, if you want to grow, you can start a threat intelligence program. You don't necessarily need to have a huge budget or a huge team. You can even have one person that's doing all of those things together. And the main idea is to start looking at a process. So more than anything else, I recommend looking at the intelligence cycle, which originally came from the military, has worked for hundreds of years for agencies and militaries around the world. And the idea behind it is really to follow all those five steps. Unfortunately, a lot of organizations trying to skip steps. A lot of organizations, they're like, Ah, uh, we don't need planning, let's just collect data. Well, we don't need analysis, let's just push it into the firewall. And then all of a sudden, you're getting all those false positives and pushback from the organization, and people say, well, intelligence sucks. Well, of course it does, you didn't follow the process. So, let's go over the process. It's, it's, it's something that worked. I really think it's worth for us to give it a try. The first thing is elementary requirements. What are we trying to protect? Or what, do we, what priority do we give into this? We don't just have threat intelligence. What are we trying to protect first? First priority. Okay. This is a, a critical for our business. It's, it's vulnerable. We want to know if it's used out there today. Now, while we continue writing our requirements, there are going to be two types of requirements, standing and ad hoc, just like in the military. The standing one is when we were intelligence, we kept on collecting information on a daily basis, updating information about the adversaries, about the, the indicators, etc. But then if there was a war, the priorities have changed. So the ad hoc is a mission-driven type of requirement. Someone is coming to you and saying, we need this now. We might be under intrusion. Uh, the CISO just asked this and we need to give him an answer. You don't say no to the CISO, right? You just go and change the priorities and then go back into the standing. So here's an example of a few questions that you might want to ask uh, or to help your management to ask when you come up with requirements. And you need to agree on those. So later on, nobody comes back to you and tells you, well, wait a second, why did you look at that, you know? We didn't ask you. So look at those things and pay attention to details. The more detailed the question is, the better off you are because then you have a specific collections that you can uh, continue working on that is driven directly from the question. So are we, are we vulnerable? That's kind of too vague of a question, right? Be more specific with the question and try to help your management coming up with, with, with the right question. Sometimes they, they don't get those right questions out of the bat. Now that we have our requirements, let's look at collection. Trying to look at collection just like in the military, you're gonna have multiple sources. I would recommend start with your internal network, right? Start answering questions like, okay, what incident we had in the past? Let's start to look at uh, the specific indicators there. They're definitely relevant for us, right? And we can trust them because we found them within our environment. Then you ask yourself, what's the difference between what I know and what I need to know? And then you reach out to external indicators. External indicators coming in from OSINs. There's a lot of free stuff out there. I'll show you in at least in a second. You don't need to pay a penny for it. And some of it is good. Some of it some have some context around it. And only then think about buying 
commercial feed. And when you buy commercial feed, think about what is it helping you with, right? Make sure that it's rich or related to the terminology that, that the organization speaks. Make sure that it's not just a company that aggregates some free stuff out there and selling it to you. There's a lot of snake oil out there. A lot of snake oil, I'm telling you. People pay a lot of money for nothing. And like mentioned earlier, go to the communities. If you are in finance, go to FSISEC. It's going to be much more focused to your specific needs. So I'm going to publish this PowerPoint later on, so um, don't have to take the photos now, but there's, there's some good stuff out here, and it's free. Um, it's basically also around the sources. Uh, you, you're getting uh, uh, information coming in from HoneyNets. Uh, there's there's uh, information coming in regarding spur phishing, uh, information regarding uh, fake SSL certificates. So depending on the project you're working on with regards to your organization, you might want to reach out to a different uh, source here. You need to aggregate normalized information, you know, make sense out of it. One thing that um, I'm not going to talk about, but you, you're welcome to look at, uh, is threat intelligence models. There's a lot of models out there. And, you know, the diamond models, the, the uh, target-centric models, it's just a fancy name for containers. So don't worry as much as about the model, as long as you have a model. Uh, you can look them up and find out which one works better for you, but you definitely want to start putting those into buckets. And there are a lot of open source solutions there for uh, threat intelligence platforms. Um, just going to mention, obviously there's a framework that the government is providing, DHS, uh, uh, they sell a, a, or they, they support a, this uh, AIS feed. Um, MISP, that started with the malware-based uh, kind of um, sandbox and, and analysis reports, now is, is the whole threat intelligence platform. Creates um, open source that you can use. Not that easy to, to implement, but once you implement it, uh, it's, it's pretty uh, flexible. And then sticks and taxi, all, all the way to the bottom. Anyone heard about, about sticks? That really um, turns to be the standard for exchanging information for threat intelligence in the industry. Uh, there is open source there. If you really up to write your own sticks and taxi client, uh, go ahead. But there's also um, Soldier Edge community and some other uh, uh, already existing tools uh, to ingest automatically all the threat information. Um, analysis. This is a pain point in a lot of companies I work with because, like I said, a lot of the, the, the work with threat intelligence could be automated. You still need the human element. You still need to understand what is it about? And uh, th those are all techniques used in the army uh, or in the agency. Uh, I think link analysis, this is uh, Maltigo. I don't know if you heard of Maltigo, but you can look it up. Great tool. Uh, understanding what are the best, in, best case scenarios and what are the worst case scenarios with, with any situation and starting investigation each one of them. It's going to help you kind of scope the, the threat and then uh, you can look up uh, analysis of competing hypotheses. Again, something that came from the agency uh, was uh, created by Richard Ure. Uh, look him up, look his books. Uh, a great material that is way out of the scope of this one, um, this talk, uh, about biases and how you can overcome biases. Because when you're starting using the human element, it's also biases, right? I come from Israel, I live in New York, I have three kids. I'm thinking differently than each and every of you guys. And so my bias can also influence my, my decisions when I'm working with threat information, right? I would think any IP address here is, is a terrorist attack. That's where I'm coming from. So uh, be aware of biases. 
And an example of analysis is, is a course of actions, right? So once we know where the problem is, let's start to look at this. This is too small, but um, you can look it up again. It's, it's basically the defensive security posture metric. So what it does is, for each one of the kitchen phases, it looks at how you can detect it, how you can deny it, uh, how you can disrupt it, uh, degrade it, uh, if it's already there. Uh, how you can contain it, etc. You can see the threat intelligence is mainly around reconnaissance there on the detection and denying, right? Because you have indicators about how people did the reconnaissance to other companies. You can take this information and help detecting reconnaissance on your environment. But then you can use also the IDCs and IPCs uh, to help you with detection of other places within, uh, within the kill chain. And finally, dissemination, we spoke about it. You want to disseminate it? Show you one example. You guys spoke about attack. We spoke about attack. This is a heat map using attack. Just looking at the different specific phases within um, uh, each and every intrusion and saying, OK, this is a count enumeration. There's a lot of them within my environment. What can I do with regards to that, et cetera? Uh, and you, uh, a new kind of trend is, is creating playbooks today, right? Everyone likes to create playbooks uh, for orchestrations and what have you. There's also a playbook for IR that is based on threat intelligence. You know, playbook, pair, pair uh, TTP, pair actor. It's going to help you when, when you when you need this fast response. Go to your playbook and see what potentially this is uh, going to do in your network. And don't forget, this whole cycle is continuously process that needs to be evaluated feedback. You need to have this loop feedback on all those, so they will dictate the next planning, collection, and uh, uh, dissemination. So you improve it with time. So we're getting close to the end of the talk. I hope it was useful. If you guys don't have any threat intelligence program today, Try starting small. You can go up this pro progress or, or maturity level of threat intelligence. You don't have to start big. Look of the stuff that I mentioned. Try to look for the low-hanging fruit. And then go from reactive, you know, just finding stuff in the internet and looking them up, to proactive. Automatically respond using threat intelligence. If you already have one intelligence program, think about how you can progress it. Now, think about those functionalities, whether uh, you already have a threat intelligence uh, specific uh, tools, who is maintaining it, etc. Again, it could be more than one person handling it, but make sure you have it. And when you leave here today, I'm going to uh, leave you with that, ask yourself those three questions. We sometimes get frustrated with threat intelligence. I understand that. But what I'm trying to say is, let's understand ourselves. And let's try to get threat intelligence a little bit more useful by following the process we mentioned here. Check whether uh, you can start our threat intelligence program by raising the agenda within your organization whether it's using IOCs for your SOC, getting tactics and techniques for your IR, or just giving some threat landscape updates to your C-levels. Let's try to push this agenda, because the adversaries work together. Threat intelligence is the way for us to work together, to get ahead of the adversaries and help protect our organization. I want to thank you for your time. Have a great day. If you have any questions, you can come over to me. Um, I think we're kind of out of time, right? So yeah, you can just come over. <laughs>